Eh, welcome, Thomas, and the floor is yours. Great, you just need to stop sharing <clears throat> so I can share. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Gimar, and um, uh, at all the organizers for uh, putting this together. Really, I know this is a massive uh, effort to have organization. So I'm really pleased to, to talk about um, uh, data sharing and best practices. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm going to do is, is sort of just motivate what's the, the problem. I'll be talking about some specific solutions and uh, sort of proposals by um, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping and then end with some, some practical uh, suggestions. Okay, so what is motivating a lot of this? <clears throat> well, you may have heard something called of the reproducibility crisis. Um, the econometricians in the world actually have another name for the same thing, which is the credibility revolution. So they're both talking about the same thing, which is that very careful examinations of efforts to replicate existing scientific findings have really fallen short. Um, I'm just highlighting two that have been led by um, uh, um, uh, Brian Nozick um, and others, but the, the first one was that published uh, in 2015 was an exhaustive uh, effort to replicate a um, uh, hundred uh, classic ex psychology experiments. And they actually in the end just got to, to 97, um, better shown in this plot here. And using a different number of means uh, th that only 39% of them. So what's shown here? Well, this is what the, what was the original reported effect size in the x-axis, and what was the replication effect size? And if all these are perfect replications, you'd expect all the effects to be basically scattered right here on the identity line. Now, to, to be fair, a lot of these do, so which is impressive, and that's good, and that's what we'd expect because these are not sort of fringe, wacky. Effects. These are kind of long established, well cited effects in psychology. But a really disappointing number are instead scattered about the zero line, saying that despite really extensive efforts to try to replicate the original methods of the, the original uh, people who published these, these, these effects, they, they could not do that. And I should say, in all of these efforts, they both try to contact the original authors and try to get all the detailed methods and try to really do the, the experiment the way of the original um, uh, work. And all of these things are pre-registered. So they really try to eliminate or fix all of the analytical methods in advance <clears throat> and before collecting any data to make sure that there's sort of no sort of vibration effects or, or a variation from the planned uh, uh, design and analysis. They have just recently done the exact same thing in cancer biology. Uh, and here it was slightly better, 51 out of 112 experiments uh, replicated. Um, and uh, similar thing, a little bit less, a little bit more disappointing actually. You almost have nothing on the identity line here in terms of effects. And, and, and so what effects that do replicate in terms of being non-zero, uh, have a, a much diminished effect size <clears throat> relative to the original effect size. So there are concerns about what can we do, because this is actually quite disappointing because uh, you know, we're scientists. The things we do should be, uh, we should be discovering uh, intrinsic properties of the world, <laughs> of the universe. And to say that actually, no, if you go off and you try to do the exact same thing, you're gonna get you know, a zero response is quite disappointing. So what can we what can we do about that? Well, you could also say, well, does this apply to neuroimaging? Well, there are different a number of different facets to this, um, and uh, and actually, it turns out that there are a number of, of things that actually influence uh, replicability. Now, one extreme case was done originally by uh, uh, Joshua Carp in 2012, where he noted that actually on any given uh, task fMRI analysis. There are a number of pre-processing options and analysis options that are reasonable and could be considered. And then when you consider a combinatorial uh, exploration of all these different reasonable uh, uh, processing uh, and analysis options, he came up with nearly 7,000 variants. Now, and when you plot those on the surface of the brain as shown here, sometimes they overlap, but actually if you look at this number, this is, <laughs> 
the exact number, never, you never get more than 500 or so lining up on the exact same location in the brain. And in fact, there's substantial variation in where you find effects uh, over these different variations. And that's maybe not surprising. You might say, well, maybe we could sort of agree on a certain combination, but even subtle things matter. It's been shown that the, the choice of the analysis software version matters. And again, that's maybe not so surprising, but what really you know, makes me shudder is that it's even been shown that the choice of operating system when running the very same analysis software version matters. <clears throat> and this on the right here is work from uh, Gronenschild in 2012, showing the different, the effect of Mac operating system on the same free surfer version on an estimating um, uh, gray matter volume. Uh, and so it's up, up, up. Uh, so, you know, mostly there are small differences, but sometimes they're up to 10, 15% differences. And this is uh, just alluding to the fact that there are uh, differences in the uh, numerical libraries that underpin all scientific so software. And general, generally, we think of these as, you know, inconsequential, but they actually can have consequences and, and, and add up. Um, also, uh, as, as, as another sort of example, is this a problem, is a, a separate problem where you say, okay, actually, you know, let's let's do kind of an ecological study. Let's take the same fMRI data set and give it to 70 different teams who agree to work strictly independently. That is before the results are reported, they agreed not to talk to anyone else about their analyses and certainly no other teams. And then all their results were uploaded. Uh, they had to give sort of a, a up down uh, sort of decisions on nine anatomically specific hypotheses, but they also had to supply on thresholded maps, thresholded maps for each of these different uh, hypotheses. And it was really, really uh, spectacular, even though this is a really well specified challenge. It was, it was a, the data was presented, everyone had the same data and the challenges, the goal was the same. Uh, when we looked at the thresholded maps, uh, the, the, the overlap is actually usually quite modest. This is down here around five, 10% and this, the reddest red only gets up to about 75%. It's so a really disappointing uh, overlap. And then um, you could say, well, that's the threshold map. Let's look at the on threshold holded maps. And this is a, a team by team correlation matrix comparing the correlation over the entire brain. Now, and what you see here is actually, oh, this is good. A lot of these teams actually have very good, sort of very high correlation uh, between uh, the, the, uh, uh, the correlation of their statistic maps, but not always, not so high. And then, this is my most worrying bit, there is a set of teams who actually had anti-correlated maps, actually did a negative correlation. And it wasn't just one team, it was about seven teams or eight teams that had uh, maps that actually had a flipped sign on average to the original, and then some very weakly correlated teams. So. Uh, this is telling that even when you give a very, you give one data set to a bunch of teams and a bunch of qualified researchers, you actually get a wide variation of responses. And so this is, this is really, this is kind of disappointing heterogeneity and kind of undermines, you know, well, how reproducible should it something be when I, when I look at it uh, in, the, in the literature. So, you know, you could ask what, what can practically be done? Um, some variation is uh, inevitable. And um, so let me just remove this panel. Um, and, and so there, 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 can, there, can some, there can be variation at the variation at that, that the CARP work from 2012 it exhibited really is an extreme because you have to ask, well, really would all 7,000 of those pipeline variants be sort of considered best? And, and actually probably not. I would say probably for a given challenge, for a given data set, there probably could be consensus among experts that, that many of those pipelines are probably suboptimal and, and actually could be, could be ruled out. So the, 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 the sort of, I think the message of this, this, this talk is, uh, follow best practices when possible. So there, there are many times when there can be sort of best, practice project, uh, um, best practices that can be followed. And um, whenever, whatever practices are followed, 
transparently report all aspects of a study design so that A, if anyone tries to replicate your work, they have the best chance of doing it. And so that a reader can, can critically assess your results in every facet, um, not just sort of, sort of be looking at it and saying, well, I don't really know what they did. So um, uh, it just sort of uh, undermines the value of the work. And the last bit, and of course that's the focus of this session today, is to share as many forms of the data as possible. Uh, when you share your data, you're allowing other researchers to basically pick up your experiment and say, oh, okay, well, what do I do when I, when I do it my way? Or, oh, here's this other hypothesis that they hadn't addressed. What happens when I, when I examine that aspect of the data? Um, you are basically enriching the scientific community by both giving people the opportunity to, to reproduce your work, but also to contribute your data to meta and mega analyses that can be conducted years later. So uh, what is the best practice? Um, and I think, you know, everyone, no one, no one sets out to do a bad study or, or, or not follow best practice. Um, but the problem is that any one researcher and certainly even any one lab is, uh, is not an expert on everything. And even, even there's no lab that actually has experts on every single facet of study design, acquisition and analysis. Hence, there's a real value to having best practice guidelines. Now, if you have worked in clinical trials, you may be aware of the equator network. So it turns out this has been a challenge that's been identified over 20 years ago by Doug Altman, uh, the statistician, uh, the late statistician at, at Oxford, who really promoted an improvement of methodological standards in his area, clinical trials. And you will find on the Equator Network, uh, basically best practice guides for um, every possible variant of clinical trials. There are even best practice guides for creating best practice guides on the Equator Network. It's really an impressive uh, resource. If you've ever done a meta-analysis, uh, then you're probably aware of the Cochrane Collaboration. Cochrane has an amazing uh, set of resources for producing um, meta-analyses, again, focused on clinical trials, but there's a lot of the principles that can be shared any type of meta-analysis um, um, in, in, in a standardized and sort of best practice way. Well, what about neuroimaging? Well, I was uh, lucky enough to be involved with the Organization for Human Brain Mapping's effort on establishing the best practices in data analysis and sharing. Um, this was identified as an issue way back in, in 2014. Um, the leadership of, of OHBM realized that there is, there is something to be said about you know, this, this, this crisis of reproducibility, what can be done? And we realized that OHBM was in a position to actually gather experts and make a, a statement about what are uh, good and better practices. So it, it rolled out over a couple of years, um, but it was a community effort. We, we got some experts together to actually create a, a, a white paper, but then we invited input from the entire uh, community, both OHBM, we didn't actually check memberships. Anyone who wanted to comment on the uh, covid draft, uh, we, we took their, 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 um, their input. This first report was finally published on, in 2016, in May, and focused on uh, MRI of the brain. Um, and then there was a corresponding um, uh, short commentary that was published in, in Nature and Neuroscience. So you can find this at the, the link uh, above. I'm gonna share my slides. Um, it's really an exhaustive uh, report trying to co comment on every single aspect of um, an MRI uh, an MRI study. So we structured it in these seven sort of seven areas. So first is experimental design recording. So basically, what is everything that happens before you walk into the scanner room? What are all the aspects of, that go into planning and designing the study? And the focus throughout COBIDAS is sometimes, you know, there's so many different ways to do things. A lot of times it's hard to explicitly um, tell you what to do. <laughs> You know, there are ethical considerations. You should always have ethical consent for working with your subjects. But the exact details, of course, vary by, you know, by institution, even to, by country. But what the, we focus on is what you should be reporting. You should always report that you have the ethical considerations. You should report on all the different ways you arrived at the, the design you used. Um, acquisition is everything that goes into the specifying the, 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 the acquisition parameters. 
uh, in a way, that's kind of everything you, you've configured in the on the scanner console before a subject is, is ever scanned. Um, and as well as once the data has been acquired, some basic uh, quality control. Uh, then there's everything that you do to the data before you actually model it, which we call pre-processing. And again, so many different ways to do all this, this, this work. And so the focus is on reporting. Um, and so again, we'll all just look through the, the statistical modeling inference, results reporting, data sharing, and reproducibility. Um, data sharing uh, and reproducibility are kind of the most, they were the most new aspects at the time, and we're, we are revising the covid uh, report, and all these areas will be updated. I would also just say that among all these different areas, it's probably within statistical modeling and inference where we have the most prescriptive. That's, there's, there, there's certainly some things that we consider bad practice there, and we try to uh, outline what those are. And for the sake of time, I'll just skip through this. But the point is that there's a, a long prose section of the document that sort of says, you know, what are the principles? And then they're actually just a list of things like, you know, what should you report? Uh, you know, if you really want to be exhaustive, you know, how many subjects did you approach? How many actually consented? Um, of course, these are, if these are, if you can do them, that's great, but we won't consider them mandatory, whereas certainly a number of subjects participated and analyzed as mandatory. So there are all these different items that are um, uh, detailed. Some of them are atomic. Some, uh, some of them are kind of more descriptive. Um, you know, what were the instruments? Uh, how did you match populations of doing matching? Versus. So just to say a few words about data sharing specifically, the point is you need to plan for data sharing. You need to ensure your ethics can allow you to share the data. And, um, and, and then before you even collect any data, write down for you and your collaborators a data management plan. How are you gonna share this data? What should you share? Well, you, as much as possible. Uh, so some people are adamant that you should share the DICOM. This is uh, hard. This has issues related to anonymization. It's hard to make sure you successfully anonymize the data. Sorry, that's my coffee maker. Um, preferred and you'll learn more about it is bids uh, in various formats and uh, basically it's, it's I would say the most important thing is the bid to raw data it probably gives subsequent amount, subsequent uh, analysts the most choice and then where to share sorry where to share um, there are many at this point many options there's uh, open neuro which is there to collect the, um, uh, MRI data uh, neuro vault which collects the results um, and at this point many many options uh, even things like fig share. Uh, just to say that we're continuing to work on Kubernetes, and if you work in MEG, there is a standard as well. Right. So sorry, I um, uh, thought I could get this more quickly, but just to, to say that um, there are countless uh, decisions that are made in any study, and there are countless analysis options. And it is uh, sort of our job to, to use the the best possible ones, and then to transparently report all of those decisions so that anyone reading our paper can both have the best job of interpreting our results and the best chance, if they want to, to reproduce them. Um, and the, the best weapons in this reproducibility challenge is to, to use the best practice guidelines, be really transparent. And I really always put it this way, imagine you were to just give your paper to your colleague who doesn't know your work and say, reproduce, but you gave them data and here's a paper. Could they really reproduce the analysis that you've put into that paper? I think oftentimes that's not the case. Um, and then finally share your data in as many forms as possible. Okay, I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Oh, there's a separate Q&A. Thank you, thank you, Sorry. Uh, I think Patric uh, Patricia asked on the question and answer if you want to read it and yeah ASL suffers from high variability and it's and it's been reported that 10% can be attributed to technical methodological factors 90% is called by factors related to the individual scanner is this also the case for fMRI um, I would say fMRI has there's been more and more reports on the the I would say the interclass correlation of task fMRI and it is it is disappointing. I don't, I'm not sure if it's as, as unstable as ASL there. Um, well, I, I haven't seen a breakdown of the factors of, of, of uh, fMRI variation. <clears throat> but um, uh, so yeah, I don't have an exact answer to that, but it's, it's, it's we wish it was, was higher. Um, and I, I would say there's recent work, um, 
I don't have the, the reference at hand that has been looking at this, trying to do it. There's been a meta-analysis of fMRI reproducibility. And uh, I'll, I'll paste that in into the, the chat later. Um, that's, that's a great place to start with that. Thank you. I would like to also ask, ask you about multiverse a analysis where you could maybe analyze all the options that you could get if you have if you know of any tool or useful resources or is just uh no it's actually it's a research interest of mine right now so in a way the the narps work was a 70 dimension multiverse right where all the different dimensions were de determined by different teams but the outcome of the narps i would say is that you know really if all those are you know reasonable some some scientists are standing behind them why don't we try to explore that and that's a need right now there's a need to, to have tools both to actually execute all the different variants but also to um, synthesize them together so that's that's an area of ongoing research yeah okay okay thank you so let's see if next year in the next talk someone yes yeah. about this